Book Six. But, says our adversary, the mind also will have pleasures of its own. Let it have them, then, and let it sit in judgment over luxury and pleasures. Let it indulge itself to the full in all those matters which give sensual delights. Then let it look back upon what it enjoyed before, and with all those faded sensualities fresh in its memory, let it rejoice and look eagerly forward to those other pleasures which it experienced long ago, and intends to experience again. And while the body lies in helpless repletion in the present, let it send its thoughts onward towards the future, and take stock of its hopes. All this will make it appear, in my opinion, yet more wretched, because it is insanity to choose evil instead of good. Now no insane person can be happy, and no one can be sane if he regards what is injurious as the highest good and strives to obtain it. The happy man, therefore, is he who can make a right judgment in all things. He is happy who, in his present circumstances, whatever they may be, is satisfied and on friendly terms with conditions of his life. That man is happy, whose reason recommends to him the whole posture of his affairs. Book 7. Even those very people who declare the highest good to be in the belly see what a dishonorable position they have assigned to it, and therefore they say that pleasure cannot be parted from virtue, and that no one can either live honorably without living cheerfully, nor yet live cheerfully without living honorably. I do not see how these very different matters can have any connection with one another. What is there, I pray you, to prevent virtue existing apart from pleasure? Of course the reason is that all good things derive their origin from virtue, and therefore even those things which you cherish and seek for come originally from its roots. Yet if they were entirely inseparable, we should not see some things to be pleasant but not honorable, and others most honorable indeed, but hard and only to be attained by suffering. Add to this that pleasure visits the basest lives, but virtue cannot coexist with an evil life, Yet some unhappy people are not without pleasure. Nay, it is owing to pleasure itself that they are unhappy. And this could not take place if pleasure had any connection with virtue. Whereas virtue is often without pleasure, and never stands in need of it. Why do you put together two things which are unlike and even incompatible one with the other? Virtue is a lofty quality, sublime, royal, inconquerable, untiring. Pleasure is low, slavish, weakly, perishable. Its haunts and homes are the brothel and the tavern. You will meet virtue in the temple, the marketplace, the senate house, manning the walls, covered with dust, sunburnt, horny-handed. You will find pleasure skulking out of sight, seeking for shady nooks at the public baths, hot chambers, and places which dread the visits of the idle, soft, effeminate, reeking of wine and perfumes, pale or perhaps painted and made up with cosmetics. The highest good is immortal. It knows no ending, and does not admit of either satiety or regret. For a right-thinking mind never alters or becomes hateful to itself. Nor do the best things ever undergo any change, but pleasure dies at the very moment when it charms us most. It has no great scope, and therefore it soon cloys and wearies us, and fades away as soon as its first impulse is over. Indeed, we cannot depend upon anything whose nature is to change. Consequently, it is not even possible that there should be any solid substance in that which comes and goes so swiftly, and which perishes by the very existence of its own functions, for it arrives at a point at which it ceases to be, and even while it is beginning always keeps its end in view. Book 8. What answer are we to make to the reflection that pleasure belongs to good and bad men alike, and that bad men take as much delight in their shame as good men in noble things? This was why the ancients bade us lead the highest, not the most pleasant life, in order that pleasure might not be the guide, but the companion of a right-thinking and honorable mind. For it is nature whom we ought to make our guide. Let our reason watch her, and be advised by her. To live happily, then, is the same thing as to live according to nature. What this may be, I will explain. If we guard the endowments of the body and the advantages of nature with care and fearlessness, as things soon to depart and given to us only for a day, if we do not fall under their dominion, nor allow ourselves to become the slaves of what is no part of our being, if we assign to all bodily pleasures and external delights the same position which is held by auxiliaries and light-armed troops in a camp, if we make them our servant, not our masters, then and then only are they of value to our minds. A man should be unbiased and not to be conquered by external things. He ought to admire himself alone, to feel confidence in his own spirit, and so to order his life as to be ready alike for good or for bad fortune. Let not his confidence be without knowledge, 
nor his knowledge without steadfastness. Let him always abide by what he has once determined, and let there be no erasure in his doctrines. It will be understood, even though I append it not, that such a man will be tranquil and composed in his demeanor, high-minded and courteous in his actions. Let reason be encouraged by the senses to seek for the truth, and draw its first principles from thence. Indeed, it has no other base operations or place from which to start in pursuit of truth. It must fall back upon itself. Even the all-embracing universe and God who is its guide extends himself forth into outward things, and yet altogether returns from all sides back to himself. Let our mind do the same thing, when, following its bodily senses, it has by means of them sent itself forth into the things of the outward world, let it remain still their master and its own. By this means we shall obtain a strength and an ability which are united and allied together, and shall derive from it that reason which never halts between two opinions, nor is dull in forming its perceptions, beliefs, or convictions. Such a mind, when it has ranged itself in order, made its various parts agree together, and, if I may so express myself, harmonized them, has attained to the highest good. For it has nothing evil or hazardous remaining, nothing to shake it or make it stumble. It will do everything under the guidance of its own will, and nothing unexpected will befall it, but whatever may be done by it will turn out well, and that too readily and easily, without the doer having recourse to any underhand devices. For slow and hesitating action are the signs of discord and want of settled purpose. You may, then, boldly declare that the highest good is singleness of mind, for where agreement and unity are, there must the virtues be. It is the vices that are at war one with another. Book 9 But, says our adversary, you yourself only practice virtue because you hope to obtain some pleasure from it. In the first place, even though virtue may afford us pleasure, still we do not seek after her on that account, for she does not bestow this, but bestows this to boot. Nor is this the end for which she labors, but her labor wins this also, although it be directed to another end. As in a tilled field, when plowed for corn, some flowers are found amongst it, and yet, though these posies may charm the eye, all this labor was not spent in order to produce them. The man who sowed the field had another object in view. He gained this over and above it. So pleasure is not the reward or the cause of virtue, but comes in addition to it. Nor do we choose virtue because she gives us pleasure. But she gives us pleasure also if we choose her. The highest good lies in the act of choosing her, and in the attitude of the noblest minds, which when once it has fulfilled its function and established itself within its own limits has attained to the highest good, and needs nothing more. For there is nothing outside of the whole, any more than there is anything beyond the end. You are mistaken, therefore, when you ask me what it is on account of which I seek after virtue, for you are seeking something above the highest. Do you ask what I seek from virtue? I answer, herself, for she has nothing better, she is her own reward. Does this not appear great enough, when I tell you that the highest good is an unyielding strength of mind, wisdom, magnanimity, sound judgment, freedom, harmony, beauty? Do you still ask me for something greater, of which these may be regarded as the attributes? Why do you talk of pleasures to me? I am seeking to find what is good for man, not for his belly. Why, cattle and whales have larger ones than he. Book 10 You purposefully misunderstand what I say, says he. For I too say that no one can live pleasantly unless he lives honorably also. And this cannot be the case with dumb animals who measure the extent of their happiness by that of their food. I loudly and publicly proclaim that what I call a pleasant life cannot exist without the addition of virtue. Yet who does not know that the greatest fools drink the deepest of those pleasures of yours, or that vice is full of enjoyments, and that the mind itself suggests to itself many perverted, vicious forms of pleasure? In the first place, arrogance, excessive self-esteem, swaggering precedence over other men, a short-sighted, nay, a blind devotion to his own interests, dissolute luxury, excessive delight springing from the most trifling and childish causes, and also talkativeness, pride that takes a pleasure in insulting others, sloth, and the decay of a dull mind which goes to sleep over itself. All these are dissipated by virtue, which plucks a man by the ear, and measures the value of pleasures before she permits them to be used. Nor does she set much store by those which she allows to pass current, 
for she merely allows their use, and her cheerfulness is not due to her use of them, but to her moderation in using them. Quote, Yet when moderation lessens pleasure, it impairs the highest good. End quote. You devote yourself to pleasures, I check them. You indulge in pleasure, I use it. You think that it is the highest good, I do not even think it to be good. For the sake of pleasure, I do nothing. You do everything. Book 11 When I say that I do nothing for the sake of pleasure, I allude to that wise man, whom alone you admit to be capable of pleasure. Now I do not call a man wise who is overcome by anything, let alone by pleasure. Yet, if engrossed by pleasure, how will he resist toil, danger, want, and all the ills which surround and threaten the life of man? How will he bear the sight of death or of pain? How will he endure the tumult of the world, and make head against so many active foes? If he be conquered by so effeminate an antagonist, he will do whatever pleasure advises him? Well, do you not see how many things it will advise him to do? It will not, says our adversary, be able to give him any bad advice, because it is combined with virtue. Again, do you not see what a poor kind of highest good that must be which requires a guardian to ensure its being good at all? And how is virtue to rule pleasure if she follows it, seeing that to follow is the duty of a subordinate to rule that of a commander? Do you put that which commands in the background? According to your school, virtue has the dignified office of preliminary tester of pleasures. We shall, however, see whether virtue still remains virtue among those who treat her with such contempt. For if she leaves her proper station, she can no longer keep her proper name. In the meanwhile, to keep to the point, I will show you many men beset by pleasures, men upon whom fortune has showered all her gifts, whom you must needs admit to be bad men. Look at Nomentanus and Epicurus, who digest all the good things, as they call them, of the land and sea, and review upon their tables the whole animal kingdom. Look at them as they lie on beds of roses gloating over their banquet, delighting their ears with music, their eyes with exhibitions, their palates with flavors. Their whole bodies are titillated with soft and soothing applications, and lest even their nostrils should be idle, the very place in which they solemnized the rites of luxury is scented with various perfumes. You will say that these men live in the midst of pleasures, yet they are ill at ease, because they take pleasure in what is not good, 